I want to welcome Joel. Is it Frieders? Frieders, you got it. Nice work. It's all about hope. Um, what is the name of the organization again? You say it so much better than me. Hope for the day. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much um, for just you know joining in and and uh, helping. If we could just help one person, it's made a huge difference. So, um, talk about your organization, what you do, and what it's about. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we, my name is Joel Frieders, and I am the Public Policy and Strategic Partnerships Director for Hope for the Day. We are a 501c3 nonprofit based in Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, but we are pretty much international at this point, and we work to kind of punch stigma in the nose uh, regarding mental health, and we do our best to start conversations in every community, intersection, culture, industry, you name it, uh, about mental health. And we do our best to provide a clinically backed peer led education curriculum uh, mm -hmm. to as many people who are willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And we do and we deliver that type of education. Right now, we're doing a lot of it virtually, of course, thanks COVID. Uh, but we kind of were founded in the live music space uh, where we would be at festivals and concerts, you name it. And we would be providing not only uh, vetted national mental health resources, but you know, we have wristbands that say it's okay not to be okay. And we're trying to start conversations wherever we are. Um, seeing as how the last year or so has been kind of uh, silent when it comes to concerts, uh, we as an organization had to pivot and we've moved into a lot of online virtual educations, trying to keep the conversation going because we know just, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, life's been pretty heavy over the last year. So yeah. finding an outlet has been difficult. Absolutely. I know um, I'm very isolated. So I've been working in my Luckily, I have a walk-in closet, but it's a one-bedroom condo with a walk-in closet. And so um, we're slowly going to be integrating back in the studio. But it's it's it, for sure, I can't imagine as an adult what I'm going through. I always very, very vocal on air about the fact that I see a therapist and a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And I have for a long time. And I don't know what I would do if I had not. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm very open about it. But I, I mean, I can't imagine what it must be for young adults or teens yeah no same way i, I have a 13 year old and two 11 year olds and i would say that they are handling all of this so much better than i think i ever would have mm -hmm. um seeing how their entire social life is now relegated to a six inch by eight inch screen um mm -hmm. was a little devastating for a while there i mean slowly but surely we're able to kind of fall into the groove of it uh, but if we weren't open to the fact that we have no idea what they are experiencing and we have really no way of judging it or telling them how they should be feeling or acting, um, I think myself and my wife, Julie, have had a pretty uh, open response to how we don't know what they're feeling. We only know what we're feeling. And if we're feeling a little um, stir crazy, for lack of a better term, I can only imagine what it's like when you partner in that with uh, hormones and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> nowhere else to go. Um, but I, I do see a lot more growing acceptance of the fact that mental health is something that we should all be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I have not only been okay with the fact that uh, going to therapy has completely changed my life, um, but I went through a phase there where I was just simply too busy to do it. Mm -hmm. And I kept on putting it off and rescheduling and canceling and putting it off. And uh, yesterday I met with my new uh, counselor using the, uh, the, online, uh, the online video calls. And within 15, 20 minutes, like my stomach was a thousand percent better. So it, it's, it's being able to publicly advocate for not only it being totally cool to go see a therapist, but normalizing the conversation about what you like and what you don't like about certain styles when it comes to interacting with a, with a medical professional, I think is how we continue to kind of disarm the stigmas that have kept us quiet for so freaking long. Very important because I will say in my own experience, I've, uh, it took me quite a few therapists to get the right one. And I, I, I know because I've talked to friends of mine and people that I've met that are listeners and they say, yeah, I tried it. They weren't for me. I go, yeah, but then you weren't finding the right one. If you're not right. finding the right one, because I believe to be normal is to be abnormal. <laughs> That's normal. And, yeah. and so it's okay to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Our, like our big mantra, our tagline is it's okay not to be okay. And the reason why I think it hits so hard um, in a general sense is because it's applicable to literally any day that you are on earth. Because some days are amazing and some days are pure crap. And sometimes you can have both of those experiences within minutes of each other in the same freaking day. Right. So it's becoming more and more understanding of like your baseline identity. How am I quote unquote traditionally or typically? And then being able to kind of sense in yourself, 
when am I getting a little bit jacked up or when am I feeling a little bit down? And when you're able to identify how you simply feel different than you did when you're quote unquote, okay, you will be better ad adapted to know that maybe I should be taking some time out from my quote unquote work day and taking some me time, whether that's a 15, 20 minute walk outside or logging on and speaking with a counselor, uh, whether it's using an app or on the phone, but being able to identify the fact that I don't feel okay. Mm -hmm. So being able to do something about it is important, but also being able to acknowledge the fact that doing something for yourself doesn't have to mean goat yoga or bubble baths or effervescing bath salts and all these other things that have been kind of, you know, trivialized and made to be relatively corny or campy. Totally. Um, I know that two of the things that I do for myself every day, as, as much as I, I possibly can, is I like to do the dishes after dinner because A, it's something that I can do for my wife. Acts of service is her love language. Mm -hmm. B, I get to watch her actually take a seat because that woman does everything for me and my three kids. But then also, I can't touch my cell phone when I'm washing dishes and the cell phone is the bane of my existence. It's so everybody's putting that in front. Right. And it's, it, it's terrible that it's my only method of communication for, you know, 90% of my, uh, <laughs> my, my talking to anybody, but I have to acknowledge that I don't need to be accessible to the outside world 24 hours of freaking day. So doing things that take me away from the cell phone have been incredibly beneficial. So in addition to like the aforementioned dishes, I like to at least once a day or at least once an evening, I like to just take the time, put the cell phone down and rub my wife's feet because you also can't touch the cell phone. When you got lotion on your hands. That's right. So doing things that take you out of being accessible to everyone else and just simply enjoying where you are has been great for my mental health. So it's not like they're super expensive or, you know, I'm not traveling to far off lands to take care of my mental health. It's in my house, on my couch. And that's mm -hmm. that should be more of a uh, more of an accepted kind of conversation. Is what are you doing for yourself right now? That's awesome. In fact, I, I was... I've been doing new age when it was before it was called the now age. So now <laughs> I think mindfulness is so sold. I call it now mindlessness. You got to get go. out of your own damn head. And yeah. so um, for me, uh, my co-host was saying how, and this is only the last six months, the first six months of the pandemic, it was working 14, 15 hours because it was here. And yeah. I finally, I was, I had to go home to my parents in California. I was that isolated and going like I need to get out and yeah. I actually worked from there but it was great you know and from that moment on still working from home I learned to um, get back into my crafts I shut the phone off turn the computer off and my co-host goes how do you do that and I go I am so engrossed and I don't even know I'm like learning how to do resin I don't even know what I you know <laughs> whatever it takes you're seeing something created and you're yeah. away from that other crap and you're getting out of your own head. You're being a little mindless. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a, no, that's, that's perfect because what you're trying to do is disassociate yourself with not quote unquote doing anything, mm -hmm. meaning that you're not, you're not doing anything productive. Mm -hmm. I'm learning that the less I do to produce something, the better I am for the people around me. And if that produces a, a better experience for one of my kids or B, a, a better connection between me and my spouse, I would say that's the opposite of productive, but our, our definition of productive is so rooted in what can you prove to me that you've done in general? And I, I don't think that's necessarily um, a healthy way of living. And I, I need to be reminded. I mean, that's why I got back into counseling is because I can't seem to turn off Joel, the professional at five o'clock when I'm supposed to leave. So like, I actually just got done with eight years as an elected official um, in the sticks of outside of Chicago. And I realized that I was coming home at five, you know, leaving my, my office at five o'clock, getting on a Zoom call at six, getting off at 830. And then rather than like going up and eating something, you know, eating dinner or something like that, I would just get right back to work. And here I am working till 11, 12 o'clock at night. Then I get up at five and I do it all over again. And I'm not yeah. giving myself that extra breathing room, which means that sure, I don't want to be a guy who's accused of, you know, not doing enough. But at the same time, I've been doing so much that I've actually ruined my ability to relax. Mm. And sure, a lot of it might be rooted in, you know, growing up Catholic, which, you know, I, I've talked to thousands of people and I, I call myself a recovering Catholic. And it's not that I'm poo-pooing on the Catholics. It's like I was taught not through being told. I was taught through example that if you sit down, you're wasting time. Right. And that meant that whenever I was sick, I would find something to do around the house. Here I am, nine, ten years old. I'm folding laundry when I have a fever. I should know. Right. That rest is how you recuperate, but right. that's not how I, like, I was, I was not taught that. So at a four, I'm now 41. I am trying to go home at five o'clock and be home 
until I go to work the next morning. Because what else are we doing this stuff for? I don't want right. to beat myself into the ground so early. For what? For what's the exactly. point? It's, you know, if we're exactly. not living for the moments as much as possible for now, then what's the point? Preach. So what, what is somebody, um, how could somebody get some help if they can't afford a counselor, if they don't have insurance, something like that? Can they get help? Absolutely. So the cool thing about my organization is that I was introduced to Hope for the Day after reading an article about a concert uh, that I go to every year in Chicago called Riot Fest. And it was the first time I'd ever read anything about mental health that didn't make me feel corny or campy or cheesy. Mm -hmm. This felt like they were speaking my language. Everything was kind of in black and white and it looked like, oh, these are my people. Um, I tend to uh, gravitate towards those in the black t-shirts with the tattoos that drop F-bombs every other word. Right. Those are my people. Right. So when, when I was listening and reading about this guy speaking about hope for the day, I was like, oh, so there is an approach to discussing mental health that doesn't have to make me feel like, oh, rainbows and butterflies. I'm going to own not, join Est or whatever exactly, it is. Exactly. <laughs> like, and, and it's not that I have anything against rainbows or butterflies. I know both are important in, in different senses, but from my position, I don't ever want to make it seem, at least to me internally, that what I'm doing will make me look a certain way, which again is something that's stigmatized. But I was trying to come come at the topic of mental health from a, hey, I'm right now I'm currently healing from the loss of my friend Mike in 2017. He completed suicide in July of 2017. Mm. And I didn't know how to just be okay. Mm. So knowing that their, their tagline was, it's okay not to be okay, I was like, okay, I, I get it. Well, the first time I visited uh, Hope for the Day's website, there at the top is a button that says find help. And now, over the last couple of years, they've developed this thing called the Hope for the Day Resource Compass, where you just plop in your zip code. And once you hit enter, it opens up a new tab. And it's a partnership between Aunt Bertha, which is kind of like the Angie's list of social services. Mm -hmm. But you go on to this website, put in your local zip code, and it will open up every vetted social service that's out there. So whether it's you know finding food or finding a job or legal assistance, any of those things, housing, you name it. There's also a section for mental health. So a good example of just me and like where I'm sitting right now in Aurora, Illinois at my pharmacy, if I type in 60506 and hit enter, I'm going to be met with like 2000 social services. That's wow. a lot to sift through. Well, if wow. you use these personal filters and you check off all the things that you need help with, well, I'm looking for mental health assistance and all I want is counseling. And if it's for me, I can put in like my age range. If it's for my kid, I can put in 13 to 19. If I speak Spanish, I can click on Spanish. If I don't have any money, I can click on free or, zero, or low cost. And then when I hit apply, all of those filters, rather than giving me more things that are being sold to me, like when you go to Google and you type in find a therapist near me, right, you're right. not getting the results that are good for you. You're getting the results that somebody no, you're getting paid Yelp to put or somebody, Right, exactly. yeah, yeah. So when you remove all of the money and you remove all of the PPC and the, the, the targeted ads and all that other crap, what you do by using these filters is you remove all the things that simply don't apply to you. So you can go from 2,000 or 2,100 results for every social service in 60506, and by clicking these little boxes, it removes all the things that simply don't apply to me. So I go from 2,000 down to like 45 options. And then what I do is I, I want to be simple. Who's open right now, which is mm -hmm. also a filter. Mm -hmm. Who's open right now? Who has a phone number that I can just click on it twice and it'll open up and I can call? Because wow. rather than assuming that I need to stop, think about who I'm going to call, make it a point to call them in the future, no. It's a phone number. They're open right now. Double tap, call the freaking number. So Love we're that. trying to remove the hurdles to effective suicide prevention, which stigma is one side of it. But the other thing is, how do you find a freaking therapist or somebody to talk to if you got to call that service number on the back of your insurance card? And even oh. then, only one one session's covered every six, six to seven weeks, whatever the hell it is. Like, that's stupid. Right. So what we've been doing as an organization is not just providing the education as often as we can, wherever we can. We're also putting this resource compass link in front of everybody. It's hftd.org slash find dash help, or just go to hftd.org and click on find help. It's at the top of every freaking page. We're trying to make it easier to find immediate assistance. Especially if there's uh, somebody who's in the middle of they're about to take their own life. They need somebody right then, right now. I lost uh, my boyfriend um, at 19. He was 21. Um and it affected me the rest of my life. It's it's it was really just so hard. Um, yeah, I hear that. And they did they didn't they didn't have what they have now. And even even now, there's still such a stigma, which there is. us don't understand. And and somebody said to me, it was actually um, a recovering addict who said to me they found out they were bipolar and they were going through therapy. And after all this, um, they're doing great now, by the way. And um, she had said to me that uh, she goes, you know, it's it's amazing how you have to tell people 
as a counselor is what she's doing now. You're not the center of the universe. This isn't. And yeah. the reason you have to say that is because that tells people, look, you're not alone in this. You're not yeah. the only one dealing with this. If yeah. you put it that way, I go, wow. Yeah. It, but it's also kind of understanding like this, like mental health education was not something I ever experienced growing up. Maybe. I went to Catholic school from second grade through my senior year in high school. And I don't think we ever talked about mental health. We never once talked about thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Mm -hmm. We talked about sex maybe once. Mm -hmm. But we also did not talk about mental health. So it was almost as like poo poo to saying the word masturbation in a Catholic school. Like, ah, we're not going to talk about that. Well, because we didn't talk about it, I went so long without actually getting anything, anything off my chest that these things just become more and more built up. I, I think of life as like this cumulative experience. Mm -hmm. If you don't flush that crap out, it sticks around. So that's why like I lean on my, like I, I have a, a small group of friends in my neighborhood that I tend to just unload and I expect them to do the same. Mm -hmm. And while they they might not be as practiced in getting things off of their chest as I am, I think it's incredibly important to take the time to get those things valved off of my body. So in addition to this, this curriculum, which we try to give everywhere, we also want people to understand the difference between crisis and maintenance. So if you need something right now, because the, the shit death is about to hit the fan, however you want to put it, if you need something right now, there's four or five different crisis line options right now that are incredible. The text line 741 741, it's awesome. And you don't got to actually call anybody. So 741 741 is amazing. And, and is this anywhere? So I have listeners in Florida anywhere. and Texas. And okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So 741 741 is national. Uh, and then if you if you're an international folk outside of the United States, the same page, uh, hftd.org slash find help. If you keep scrolling, you're probably going to find your country on there. Uh, because wow. what we try to do is to provide the vetted national resources that anybody in any country can utilize. But then once you've gotten out of that crisis stage, and we do as much as we can to help people understand how to avoid entering into that crisis stage. But once you're out of it, the job now is healing and maintenance. How do you continue to work on you? when you're not in the crisis stage. And mm -hmm. that's what this resource compass is intended to do. If you don't know that these resources are in your community, how the hell are you going to utilize them? So if we great idea. Like that's remove, a great thought. Yeah, remove the, uh, remove the hurdles, which right. meaning don't make it so that you have to uh, Google it. Like I, I try to avoid Google at all costs when it comes to finding things that I need. That's why you see people on Facebook. Does anybody have any experience with rice cookers? Like that's a legitimate look. I'm not going to go on Google because I'm, I'm going to be sold to. I'm going to ask my community, what is your experience? Well, this way, if you utilize the resource compass, you're removing all of the, all of the salesmanship that's involved with the internet right now. This is just services. That's what we need to teach people how to do. I love this. This is awesome. And again, the links are all going to be floating around in front and also in the body of this vlog podcast. And um, I just, I really want to thank you for what you do um, and the passion you have. That's so important. I think that the more that we can lean on each other and know and say, Hey, it's okay. We're going to finally maybe eventually come together as a community. I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, that's the I hope. Don't know. You know, you can only hope you're out of politics now, right? Yes. Thank God. It's always thank the God. good people that leave. <laughs> but you have to understand what it like. The reason why there's no good candidates is because being a candidate sucks because right. people go through your like your entire social media history trying to find a skeleton in your closet. And I, I try to be as upfront as possible. Um, I like boobs. I like my, my wife's butt. Um, I drink alcohol. I cuss. Um, <laughs> I cuss. Like, right. Here, here's all my skeletons. Do you want right. to name them? But people are like, and, and maybe I'm different because I utilize social media as kind of a way of holding myself accountable. Mm -hmm. Do I really want to share this publicly? Mm -hmm. You know what? Most of the time, yeah, I do. I don't care if I'm dropping six F-bombs every other freaking word. That's not my intention is to make you feel comfortable. I want to be genuine and authentic. Right. So what you don't have in politics right now are people that are their authentic selves. You have people that will make decisions based on someone's idea of them as opposed to their own personal opinions. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that I had the biggest, biggest problem with is here's what an adult does. Your opinions should change with new information, right? Of course. So if you are a caveman and you, and you put your hand in a fire, that hurts. Right. You're not going to do it again. Well, if you have a, a, an idea and it's proven wrong, meaning that science or just facts or experience tells you otherwise, your opinion should change. If not, you are a freaking child. Well, in politics, if you change your mind, what are you? You're then not part of the you're party. A flip -flopper. Right, you're a you're flip, -flopper. flip flopper. Yep, man. And, so and that, true. like, part of my problem is, is that sometimes I'll be like, "No, this is the way that it is." And then two weeks later, I've done enough reading, I've had enough phone calls, read enough emails, and I'm like, 
I was wrong, uh, or my opinions have changed because I learned these things. And, oh, how dare you change your mind? I'm like, that's what a freaking adult wow. does. So oh after- my God, I got to I gotta send this to my old co-host because he used to say <laughs> to me, how come you can't stick to one opinion? I go, because I can weigh other people's. I'm listening. Yeah. He used like, to go, you're you wishy-washy. That, yeah. Uh, imagine being so omnipotent and intelligent that the thought that you have on day one is the exact same thought that you have on day 30. That's impossible unless you live in a vacuum. Right. Or you're full of crap. Right. So like my job as an elected official, I did it to do one thing. And that was to get the roads in my neighborhood done. I said I was going to run for one term and then get the hell out of here. And did they well, get I ran done? For one th- they did get done, but it took me six years. So I had to do two terms. Oh, God. So un- unfortunately, like, you know, my roads got done in 2018. I lost my friend Mike to suicide in 2017. So I was in public finding out that I lost my dude. Then I had oh. to somehow bounce back. So I got involved in mental health simply because if I didn't, I'd probably still be the miserable dude who couldn't get out of bed in 2017. Mm -hmm. I understand that things happen for a reason, but when it comes to being an elected official, the reason why there's no good candidates is because it sucks. I got yelled at for things that had nothing to do with me, like in front of the bacon and the bacon aisle at Target. Like, why are you yelling at me? Wow. So knowing that people don't sign up to change the world, but when they do, there's a certain type of personality that can handle it. I myself cannot handle it. Yeah. I am not a good politician because I don't like lying. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like sticking to my uh, my original opinion just because it was my original opinion. Mm-hmm. And I also, I genuinely care about humanity, which is impossible when you're talking about freaking potholes. And then you've got today being the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. How do you impact societal change if you're worried about freaking potholes? So the minutia ended up getting to me. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't recommend that anybody run for office unless they have the stomach to deal with the fact that everyone around you might be playing a long game that you won't realize is a long game until something else happens. And that, that was my experience. I found out that a lot of people that I had trusted were, were in it for the long game and for the wrong reasons. Mm. So I had to make sure that I got the hell out of there. Um, but my roads are done. Yay! It only takes six <laughs> years, five years six longer. Years. Yes. Oh, man. It was terrible. It was yeah. terrible. But, yeah. but I met I a lot of cool it. people, learned a lot, but it's it's... If you want a, a quick lesson on humanity, try to be an elected official with um, with ethics. That's a road and, you less traveled. <laughs> no, <laughs> you got your road paved. <laughs> imagine not having an opinion on something and being a politician. People hate that. What do you mean you don't care? I'm like, because I don't care. But it's your job to care. No, it's my job to make decisions. I can make decisions based on finances or right. uh, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So sure. you tell me. It's, right. It was a very strange place to be, but I'm glad I'm done. Well, I'm glad you did it just to get your road paved, but I'm also glad now you're doing this because this is really, really needed and important. And any final thoughts, anything that uh, you can think of? I don't want to miss yeah, out. Actually, any way um, if somebody needs, can help, maybe companies yeah, or something. If, if, yeah, if, if you want to bring the topic of mental health into your organization or company, hit me up, joel at hftd.org, or just visit the website, hftd.org. Click on contact and, and send us a note. Uh, but the way that I've been working for the, like the last few months is I've been working in the craft beer industry, which makes people a little uncomfortable. You can't talk about mental health and craft beer. Why you not? can't talk about mental health with a beer in your hand. <laughs> well, one of the things that we kind of work towards is meeting people where they're at. Mm-hmm. And I know that for the majority of my friends in my community, they're either at the craft beer bottle shop, they're at the bar, or they're at a restaurant somewhere enjoying a beverage. Mm-hmm. But what I tried to do or what we're trying to do with this things we don't say Uh, IPA craft beer for mental health project is trying to bring the topic of mental health into every independently owned brewery on the freaking planet. Right now we've got 196 breweries in eight different countries across the world Mm -hmm. are talking about mental health in their brewery. And the reason why that's important is because I have been lucky enough to have friends that have been in addiction scenarios and are now in recovery. Mm -hmm. And the idea of recovery as a parallel to a mental health crisis and what you need to do when it, when it comes to like maintenance, you are never not in recovery. Just like me, I am never not in a period where I need to be paying attention to my maintenance. So talking about what are your drinking habits? If you work in the craft beer industry, do you know what overconsumption looks like to somebody in your community? How do you not be a jerk to somebody to allow them to exist that they are currently existing without stigmatizing them into shutting up further? Right. These are all conversations that we try to have within the you know, within the industry. And it's been a little difficult because people think that we're trying to gaslight them. Um, but if you actually think about it, the people in the craft beer industry and the alcohol industry in the whole, they're kind of typecast into being, oh, you work at Disney World. 
there's you can't have a bad day in the alcohol industry. You got free booze. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Yeah. So what we're trying to get people to understand that the conversation of mental health should be had in every culture, in every company, in every industry, in every intersection. But if we're not going to take the time to have it, the problems that we have are going to continue to keep happening. So if you don't acknowledge the elephant in the room, the elephant's going to freaking sit there. If you acknowledge him, he might end up turning into either a, a house pet mm -hmm. or he'll get the hell out of the room. We're mm -hmm. trying to get people to simply acknowledge it, talk about the elephant, and then let's see what happens. Because the only way we fix some of this stuff is by talking about it. And, and I think that um, being so PC has hurt us. To be honest with you, um, absolutely, I, it's so it's getting to where people are afraid to say anything. I know in my industry, every year, no one of the top five, um, certifiably, they say, are uh, on air personalities. Wonder why? You know, in media, mm -hmm. people in media, lawyers and politicians are the other ones always on top. Um, yeah, but yeah, and 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 I think that there's so many people I know in my industry alone that don't seek medical or mental and i'm sitting there going you gotta see a therapist you gotta see something. yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's it's important and, and that's why like when we started this project one of the goals that i had was immediately to have a non-alcoholic partner mm -hmm. because just because you don't drink alcohol whether you choose to because you don't have a good relationship with it or it's bad for your health or you're allergic to brewer's yeast or whatever it might be no matter what the reason is if you're still able to sit and have a conversation with somebody, you're still a part of the community. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm thankful that um, we partnered with Wellbeing Brewing and Four Hands Brewing out of St. Louis. Yay! And we've got a product called, yeah, <laughs> we got a product called Liquid Rain, which mm -hmm. is a, a non-alcoholic hazy IPA, which is actually freaking incredible. I heard it was um, great. <laughs> it's, it, what's stupid about this beer is that if you've never had a non-alcoholic beer, and this is the first one, you're going to be sorely disappointed because not everything tastes like this. Uh, like this is actually, this is a good beverage, mm -hmm. but yes, it, it, it's, it's got all the qualities of a beer, except there's no booze, but knowing that the impact on our mental health that alcohol can have, why aren't we talking about mental health in craft beer anyway? So this is something where way you put it exactly. Though, yeah. So like, like well-being brewing, I can't say enough about Tom and Jeff, like just amazing people that are coming at the conversation from a, Hey, just because I don't actually imbibe alcohol, doesn't make me not part of your community. They are, they're hitting all of the points when it comes to why do we exist and why do we care? And being able to have, you know, we started with Eagle Park Brewing in Milwaukee. And then the second partner was well-being brewing with four hands. And they collaborated on a non-alcoholic hazy IPA that is just as banging and delicious as the alcoholic versions if you do care to drink. Knowing it's that funny, we don't have to our, be drinking alcohol of, uh, to have a conversation. Yeah, one of my uh, uh, guests, one of my recoverers, she exactly, she brought up four hands. She goes, I just wish more people would make it. But she goes, because I, I socially... Sometimes there's people that are acquainted. I don't even know them that well. They don't need to know that I don't drink alcohol right. because I'm an alcoholic. She goes, yeah. so it, it's like you're accepted then a little bit more. It's a very strange it. stigma. And, and, and that's, I think that's something that it's really good. That's as soon as this project has kind of subsided, I think my next goal is going to be to approach every craft brewery in the country and see if they want to do a non-alcoholic craft beer collaboration with well-being because I love the guys from well-being because they're good people but the product's actually pretty banging. Like the first time I had one of the regular IPAs, I didn't know that it was non-alcoholic until I was about three or four sips in. I was going, okay, my mind has been changed. Again, my mind, my opinions change with new information. And the new information was an IPA from Wellbeing and it was banging. So I love that. We, we can all change our minds. You just have to be open to the fact that you're not perfect. It's, it's okay to learn. Fire is hot. Don't mm -hmm. touch it twice. Got right. it? Like that's, right. we, we can be as, as simple as we want, but the goal, of course, is to remove any idea of there being a stigma attached to the conversation. No, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go up to people that I don't know and say, man, I'm really stressed out. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to utilize my community or I'm going to find a professional. Right. And then if that my community isn't helping or that one professional isn't helping, switch it up. Like there's no reason that this one person who was able to you know, hop on a, on a Zoom call with you for a therapy session they don't have to be the only one. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, a therapist or a counselor will not be offended if you don't go back for round two because right. there's plenty of people out there. Absolutely. We need to be more okay with finding a counselor or a therapist and trying them out. And if it doesn't fit, switch it up. And if that doesn't fit, switch it up. I've switched up four or five different times. I don't, I'm not insulting the people by not going and visiting them twice. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. Mm -hmm. Advocate for you. And sometimes you grow out of them as this happened yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm going out of you, I'm on to another one. And they're fine yeah. with it. They get it. Yeah. Or I've had the problem where I become too friendly with them and I'm like, 
I don't want to tell you these things because I don't want you to think badly of me. Okay, you're fired. Right. <laughs> oh, I had one that just talked about themselves the whole time. I'm like, okay, this is great. That's my job. This is the Joel hour. I just, can... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. It's about me right now. <laughs> Hey, you want to pay me like I'm here for you. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Listen, my uncle, God love him. Rest in peace. He was he was a psychiatrist. Brilliant man. And um, he he tried suicide three times. You know, it's it's I was going, how come you didn't see a therapist? That's what I see. Unfortunately. Yeah, there's there's no discrimination when it comes to the impacts of mental health. We're we're not in a position where, oh, it's just the poor people. Nah, uh, there's a lot more rich people, a lot more miserable than a whole bunch of poor people. But that's the thing. It's not a freaking competition. I keep on having to say there is no totem pole of pain. There's no pain Olympics. What you experience and the intensity with which you experience can be totally different than somebody else. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like I can have a hole in my sock and you could have a hole in your shoulder from a freaking shotgun wound. Yes, they both suck. One does require immediate, uh, you know, immediate attention from a medical professional. The other one's an annoyance. But how come a simple annoyance to me could traumatize me, whereas a gunshot for you might be like, eh, it's Wednesday. Like, Mm -hmm. we need to start being okay with people going through things that we don't have any impact on. Like, I should not be woulda-ing, shoulda-ing, or coulda-ing anything that you've experienced because I'm not you. Right. Coming to those terms is very difficult for some people because we think that we have to compare two people's experiences. Mm. That was the biggest eye-opener for me. Here I am, a white, privileged, cisgender, heterosexual man with like literally the most beautiful wife on the freaking planet. Three amazing kids. What do I have to complain about? What? I can't have anxiety. I I can't, I can't be, I can't have a horrible time sleeping. Like to not give someone the permission to simply exist the way that they are existing is complete BS. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get over it is to realize that you have no impact on anyone else's life. The only job that we all have, and this is my rule, the only job that I have every day is to make sure with every interaction that I have with somebody else, I don't make it worse Mm because everybody's having a really, really crappy time right now. So why would I want to be the reason why somebody had a worse time? Mm -hmm. So don't pile on and go about your business without worrying what other people think. I know it's easier said than done, but it's it's important for me as a human to continue to advocate for those who don't don't yet have the voice to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do this work. Well, thank you. And uh, we definitely definitely will. I'd love to have you back again. And I'd love to have people from four hands on and, uh, you know, have them talk about it. Cause I I love that, what that they're doing that in, in our community and and that you're doing this nationally. So internationally, internationally. Yes. We have one in England. Uh, We just had one in China sign up a couple in Brazil, one in Belgium, one in the Netherlands couple in Canada. Yeah, it's it's everywhere and it's inspiring as hell and I can't wait to try them all. 